station's arm to rotate and install the cargo spacecraft on the Earth-facing port of the station's Unity module. Time 21, the Cygnus spacecraft is scheduled to remain at the space station until November, when it will depart the station, disposing of several tons of trash during a fiery re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. And FSO, you go to send FTS receiver arm command for two seconds, then remove. Continue check channel when function removed. This is FSO, arm on my mark. Three, two, one, mark, plus one, plus two, arm removed, check channel continued. LC like two, FPS arm indication received. Teams around the country are working together today to ensure various systems are a go for launch. Northrop Grumman teams in the Antares Launch Control Center in Wallops Island, Virginia, are monitoring systems on the Antares rocket. And once Cygnus separates from the Antares, as Rock Day and reaches its preliminary orbit, controls of the vehicle will be handed over to teams at Northrop Grumman's Mission Control Center in Dulles, Virginia. Teams there are being led by Mission Director Teresa Spinelli. And back in the International Space Station Flight Control Room in Houston, Texas, flight control teams are being led by Flight Director Greg Whitney. Teams here are monitoring systems on the International Space Station, ensuring all systems are a go for Cygnus launch today and arrival to the International Space Station. And so far, all teams are a go for launch today at 5.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Central Time, 6.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Eastern Time. And joining us for today's launch broadcast from Northrop Grumman is Antares System Engineering Program Manager, Christina Halona, and she'll be walking us through some of the features and milestones for today's launch. Christina, the launch was moved to the back of the launch window today. Can you explain what the teams detected on the ground and how it was resolved? Hi, Courtney, sure. So during our pre-launch checkouts, we detected an anomalous reading at the pad. So our Atlantic range space Support and Northrop Grumman teams had to troubleshoot the issue out at the pad, which actually required um, our teams to physically inspect the pad. So after we had previously already cleared out of the pad uh, for safety issues, obviously, um, so we had to get back out there and uh, check out and make sure everything was um, up and running and everything looked good. And so that actually took a little bit longer than expected. Um, so it took us to the tail end of our launch window. So uh, everything looked good, and we're ready to go. Go for launch. Yes, and we're looking live now at the Antares rocket standing ready to launch a Cygnus cargo spacecraft carrying more than 8,200 pounds of research, crew supplies, and hardware to the International Space Station. Christina, can you tell us more about this Antares 230-plus rocket's capabilities? Sure. So the Antares 230-plus vehicle provides substantial payload performance into a variety of low inclination, low Earth and sun synchronous orbits and interplanetary trajectories. So our interiors has actually been upgraded, our stage one core, which has a ladder composite structure and an optimized second stage motor. The upgraded stage one core allows the interiors engines to perform at full thrust throughout most of the first stage profile. The 230-plus vehicle also has a cargo mass flexibility in which the Cygnus mass can be defined no later than 24 hours prior to launch. The Antares 230-plus vehicle also has the ability to perform late load operations by the unique pop-top fairing as the nose of the vehicle is able to remove for the late cargo load. And opening valve 8021 on my mark, three, two, and the vehicle rolled out to the pad Friday, August 6th. It was then rotated horizontal for some late cargo, like you're saying now, and then it was returned to its vertical position where it sits now yesterday. So Christina, can you walk us through the cargo late loading process and late load capabilities? 
too, you can resume your... Yeah, sure. So as I mentioned before, one of the unique features of the Interior's 230 Plus vehicle is that there is the ability to do a late cargo load 24 hours before launch. Uh, the vehicle has a pop-top furring where the nose of the rocket is able to be removed. Northrop Grumman has also built a new specialized ground support equipment that allows us to take the vehicle from vertical, like you see it out the pad, and take it back horizontal, uh, which we did um, previously, actually last night. <laughs> So this allows us to drive uh, what we call a mobile clean room right up to the tip of the fairing where we are able to remove the pop-top fairing and load time sensitive research experiments and uh, other perishable items that NASA needs to provide 24 hours before launch. And so with all this talk about cargo, the interior vehicle is carrying approximately a little over 8,200 pounds of cargo to the space station aboard the Cygnus spacecraft today, which is actually our largest resupply to date. So we're very excited about that. And uh, we at Northrop Grumman, we're, we're really proud of our Antares 230-plus rocket and the Cigna spacecraft, and we're dedicated to, to continue to providing the best value to our customer in support of their critical mission. And just going off of that, Antares and Cygnus have now been part of the chain of resupply for the International Space Station for several years now. How crucial has Northrop Grumman's role been in contributing? So Northrop Grumman has played a critical role in keeping the International Space Station operational since 2013, and this was apparent with NASA awarding Northrop Grumman two additional commercial resupply missions to continue to deliver cargo such as food, hardware, science experiments, and other necessities. And Cygnus is unique in its ability to carry a way large amount of pressurized cargo, a critical function for NASA and the crew aboard the ISS. With these additional awarded flights to the orbiting laboratory, you know, NASA Grumman will provide services to both NASA and our commercial partners to continue to use Cygnus, not as just a cargo delivery and disposable vehicle, but also as a platform for science and technology research development opportunities. And since 2013, Northrop Grumman has been a trusted and reliable partner to NASA, and we look forward to this continued partnership into the future. And now teams have been running through some pre-launch milestones today, and um, they'll continue to run through those through launch. Can you tell us a little bit more about the fueling process? Yeah, so um, um, I'll just go through the entire ascent, actually. Um, so we're, when and Terry's, we'll have a stage recognition at T0, and we'll lift off shortly after. Um, the main engine will burn off for approximately 200 seconds, and that will get us to main engine cutoff, which we call MECO. And then once we get to MECO, we'll go into a short coach right before we separate stage one from stage two, which we call the upper stack portion of Antares. Um, we'll con continue to coast a little bit longer, about 30 seconds before fairing separation, and then we'll have an internal separation where the stage two flies out of the external upper stack. So once stage two is completed of the upper stack, the stage two ignites for a two and a half minute burn that puts Cygnus real close to their orbit. And then we'll coast the, and then Cygnus will coast a little bit to ensure everything is stable. And then Cygnus will be released into the desired orbit. So after Cygnus is released, so we'll go through comm checks. And then about an hour or so after we separate, Cygnus will release its solar arrays and be on its way to the National Space Station. And I believe you at NASA, you guys uh, also show the solar arrays deployment sometimes. So you guys all might get to see that again later. Um, but in summary, it takes approximately Cygnus uh, nine minutes to get to orbit. So it's a, it takes some time, but it is pretty fast. Well, Christina, we're looking forward to welcoming Cygnus aboard the International Space Station. And of course, we'll have you back to join us after launch as well. So do you have any final words before launch today? Uh, no, I don't. Go in Terry's and go Cygnus. All right, thanks, Christina. You just heard from Northrop Grumman, our Antares System Engineering Program Manager, Christina Halona. Stay tuned after launch for a post-launch interview with Christina again and an interview with Jeff Arend, NASA's Systems Engineering Integration Office Manager. Again, mostly sunny skies for launch today back at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport at NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia, and temperatures are now about 83 degrees Fahrenheit at the pad.
Again, going up on Cygnus today is more than 8,200 pounds of research, crew supplies, and hardware, which is Cygnus's heaviest load to date. Within that cargo is 3,078 pounds of crew supplies, 2,346 pounds of science investigations, 33 pounds of spacewalk equipment, 2,286 pounds of vehicle hardware, and 98 pounds of computer resources. Cygnus will also carry a new mounting bracket that astronauts will attach to the port side of the station's backbone during a spacewalk planned for later this month. The mounting bracket will enable the installation of the next pair of IROSA solar arrays at a later date. Now let's take a quick look at some of the scientific investigations traveling to the space station on this mission. And of course, it's always waiting for the crew to receive new experiments, but they'll also have some extra goodies arriving. Also flying on Cygnus today are some treats for the crew, just to name a few. The crew will be receiving apples, tomatoes, kiwis, pizza kits, and cheese assortments. CMD, yeah, you're good. Chance for Cygnus to launch mode. In work. Copy and work. Coming up on 15 minutes from launch today, all systems are still on track for an on-time launch today at 5.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Central Time, 6.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Eastern Time. Provide status of trajectory file for launch operation. LC, GNC-1, trajectory file does not require an update. Copy that, we'll check 403 and OPS-14 for LC, countdown one. Yeah, LC, I've got uh, step 394 for you. Fuel level does not require adjustment. Roger that. Prop two, step 395, arm OCC, OCCS for no adjustment to fuel level. And OCCS, ACDC armed. ACDC confirmed. Copy, check 395, 396. And OCCS configured for no adjustment to fuel level. Check 397. Admin be advised, step 38, 398, not required. Step 399, not required. And launch team, we're coming up on T minus 14 minutes. We'll be polling for our final countdown in about a minute and a half.
Just to highlight some upcoming milestones, about 12 minutes from launch, flight controllers will conduct a poll to proceed with the final launch countdown. And about five minutes from launch, the vehicle will switch to internal power. Then just about three minutes and 30 seconds before launch, auto sequence handoff for terminal countdown will be initiated, and that will mark the time the computers take over for the final milestones before launch. Kelsey, CMD on Countdown 1. Stand by, CMD. And so those uh, constraints will be waived uh, from 4,000 uh, you know, to 3,800. And go ahead, uh, CMD. Yeah, CMD. Cygnus is in launch mode and nominal. Roger that. We'll check 407 complete. And launch team LC on countdown one with pole to proceed with final countdown. GSO. GSO go. RSL. RSOs go. TD. TDs go. Prop lead. Prop leads go. Stage one. Stand by LC. MES one. MES one go. GC. GCs go. Sorry. Ace. Aces go. Mars. Mars is go. CMD. CMD is go. And LD. I'd like to hear from stage one first. Yep. Stage Stand one by. is go. Stage one is go. LD is go. NG. Northrop Grumman is proud to honor accomplished NASA astronaut and the first Asian American in space, Ellison Onizuka. In our current challenging times, we reflect on Ellison's inspirational words. The people that make the world run, whose names will go down in the history books, are not the cynics, the critics, or the armchair quarterbacks. They are the adventurists, the explorers, and the doers of the world. When they see a wrong or a problem, they do something about it. When they see a vacant place in our knowledge, they work to fill the void. And today, we will do just that. Aloha to the SS Ellison Onizuka. Northrop Grumman is go for launch. And I copy, we're good to proceed with final countdown, check 407, fly high, Ethan. Ops 2, step 408, you go to start engine evacuation. LC Ops 2, engine evacuation started. And you just heard the poll to proceed with the final countdown to launch, and all teams are polling a go. And, of course, a tribute to Ellison Onizuka, who this Cygnus spacecraft is dedicated after. Now coming up on 10 minutes away from launch and everything is still proceeding smoothly for launch at 5.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Central Time, 6.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Eastern Time. Passing T minus 10 minutes. time today, the first thing that will occur is the stage one ignition, and you'll see liftoff just a few seconds after that, and those main two engines will burn for about three minutes and 18 seconds before cutting off, and stage one will separate. Cygnus will coast for a bit until fairing separation when the external cover that protects the spacecraft during launch will operate. The interstage adapter that connects the first and second stages will separate at about four minutes into flight, and then stage two ignition, which is that solid rocket, solid rocket fuel that will burn for two minutes and 45 seconds. Once the second stage burns out, we'll be listening for a call of orbital insertion at six minutes and 52 seconds after launch. The vehicle will coast for two minutes before Cygnus separation at nine minutes and nine seconds after liftoff. And at the time of launch, the International Space Station will be flying 260 statute miles over the southern Indian Ocean. ACS BDMs enabled, voltage nominal, ODM.
now just about eight minutes and 30 seconds to launch. Again, that next milestone we'll hear will be for the vehicle to be turned to internal power at five minutes out. And we're at T minus eight minutes. LC site control, GN2 conditioning initiated. And I copy GN2 condition, conditioning initiated. Passing T minus seven minutes. Now inside seven minutes, you've been hearing teams running through some of these final milestones and the internal power has been activated. Again, it'll be switched over to internal power at the five minute mark. Okay, copy. And when you come back up in uh, four minutes, will you be uh, ready to roll? Hope so, stand by. Okay, copy that. LC, prop lead, DTSO activation verified. Roger that, check 414, ops 2, initialize ground ordinance power supplies. LC, ops 2, ground ordinance power supplies initialized. Ground ordinance power supplies nominal. Check 415 and 416. LC site control, FA ECS transfer to GN2 confirmed. Copy that site control, check 417. T minus five minutes. Ops two, you're good. Initiate engine priming. Engine priming started. Ops one, transfer avionics to internal power. LC Ops one, all internal power on. Stand by five. And all external power off. Internal power is nominal. Ops one, open FTS zombie loop. FTS zombie loop open and green. You just heard those calls to initiate internal power for the vehicle, so internal power is now on, and all systems are still proceeding on track for launch just four minutes from now. Three, two, one, mark. Arm command sent. SNAs, ODMs, all armed. Copy that. T minus four minutes. LCS, yes. step four twenty six priming verify. Copy that. Check four twenty six complete.
and TD, I wait for your report on range status. LCTD, we are green. Copy, range green, check 425. Step 427, not required. Phase three dynamic limits uh, will be active at T minus three minutes. FC commanded to flight mode. Check 429. Auto sequence start. LCTD, we're green for all systems. Green for all systems. Audio bus voltages and currents, nominal. Copy, LEC1, and I copy. Uh, TD, we'll check 430, 431. GNC1, verify ready for NAV mode. LC, GNC1, orb nav ready for nav. Ops 2, step 433, switch to nav. LC, Ops 2, orb nav, switch to navigate. Two minutes and 30 seconds to launch, still counting down to that exact liftoff time at 5.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Central Time. Time. Tanks will be pressurized at a liftoff, but we'll be counting down to liftoff from there. Minus two minutes. Mark. Passing through T minus one minute, 30 minutes, uh, 30 seconds. Minus one minute, mark. Forty seconds until lift off. Minus 30 seconds. Mark. Twenty seconds to lift off. T minus ten. Five, four, three. Two, one. We have engine ignition. Main engine start. And we have liftoff at of seven carries for the NG-60 mission, the Wallace Flight Facility. Engine set, 100%. The SS Ellison Onizuka now on its way to the International Space Station to deliver more than 8,200 pounds of cargo. Good first stage performance so far. EV and power subsystems are normal. are nominal. Engines at 100 percent. Duration of stage one burn is approximately three minutes and 18 seconds. Currently at 65 seconds. Passing through 40,000 feet, passing max Q. 
First stage now passing through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Again, this first stage will burn for about three minutes and 18 seconds until main engine cutoff. All subsystems continue to perform as expected, passing 70,000. Mission time plus 110 seconds. Engines continue at 100%, core pressure is nominal, all vehicle subsystems nominal. Everything still proceeding nominal. One more minute. Attitude nominal, all G and C performance as expected. And Terry's performance continues nominal. Throttle down to 80%. Throttling down three minutes into flight, main engine cutoff coming soon. Throttle down to 55%. All systems nominal. Stage one, Miko. We have main engine cutoff and for stage one separation. Then stage. And Terry's is in coast phase, attitude nominal. Fairing separation. In Fairing separation confirmed. And we have stage two ignition. Stage two will burn for roughly two minutes and 30 seconds. All systems continue nominal. Stage two ignition is confirmed. Stage two is that solid rocket fuel that will burn for about two minutes and 45 seconds. Burnout will come at six minutes and 52 seconds into the flight today. And as we lose sight of the vehicle, we're now switching to animation. 4.5 kilometers per second, altitude approaching 140 kilometers. Now five minutes into flight, everything proceeding smoothly. Stage two burn continues, all systems nominal. Approaching 150 kilometers in altitude. Stage two, uh, all systems are nominal. Approximately one minute to stage two burnout. Altitude 170 kilometers. All systems perform as expected.
approximately 30 seconds to stage two burnout. Stage two burnout. All systems nominal. And stage two burnout is confirmed. will coast for approximately two minutes till spacecraft separate. And Teres is in orbit. Altitude nearly 180 kilometers. Attitude nominal. Attitude nominal. Antares continues to orient and prepare for spacecraft separation in a little more than one minute. All subsystems nominal. Altitude, 179 kilometers. Roughly 30 seconds to spacecraft separation. Standing by for spacecraft separation. Attitude nominal. Separation. Go Cygnus. Spacecraft separation confirmed and Cygnus has separated from the second stage. And Northrop Grumman teams now celebrating the confirmation of spacecraft spacecraft separation. I'll see with that. Fly out calls are completed. Copy that, uh, Ace. Okay, launch team, uh, let's uh, maintain uh, protocol on station here. We're in our post-launch checklist. Uh, prop one's already given us a step 444. Pulse purging is in progress. And GNC one, I'll wait for your call on uh, status for step 445. State vector. LC GNC one in work. And I copy in work. And site control step 446. You can remove aft bay GN2 flow and reconfigure ECS to post launch. In work. Core one LC. Step 447, direct personnel to power off the MS ground equipment and report when, clean, uh, when complete. Yeah, Kelsey, we'll get that in work once personnel can return to the LEV. Yep, copy that. And uh, right, same thing for 448, understood. With that confirmation of successful orbital insertion, Cygnus is now on its way to the International Space Station where it will arrive in two days on Thursday, August 12th to deliver more than 8,200 pounds of cargo. Back with us now from Northrop Grumman is Antares System Engineering Program Manager, Christina Holona. Christina, what will the Northrop Grumman teams in Dulles do here on the ground between now and until Cygnus arrives to the space station? Yeah, so the Nose Recruitment Teams in Dallas has a, quite a few things that they'll be doing. Um, so they operate the Cygnus spacecraft um, basically now, now that we have uh, been released from Terry's rocket. So from separation um, to reach from basically the mission, um, the Dallas team performs 
including, you know, initial vehicle co configuration following insertion orbit, um, which include priming the propulsion system. Um, they'll also have the solar array deployment as well that will be happening here uh, with you soon here in about an hour, hour and a half. Um, and then they'll also be planning and executing uh, various maneuvers to change Cygnus's orbit to rendezvous with SF. So um, that'll be continually changing um, throughout their um, maneuvers to get to the um, laboratory. And then there's also vehicle um, system checkout. So we continue to monitor the spacecraft as well to make sure it's healthy and everything is looking great onto, on, the, on the spacecraft. And then at the end, they'll finally perform vehicle configurations to perform the final rendezvous as they arrive to the ISS. And looking forward to Cygnus departure in November, Cygnus will perform some secondary operations. Can you go over some of those? Yeah, so Cygnus actually has uh, two secondary mission objectives for this NG-16 mission. After it departs from the International Space Station, um, there's one that is a passive payload from NASA called CREPI, and it stands for Kentucky, Kentucky Reentry Probe Experiment, um, and the payload will be loaded into the pressurized volume of the Cygnus with the disposal cargo items. And the other payload is PURPLE, which is short for Prototype Infrared Payload, Purple is a Northrop Grumman built payload and will be tested and calibrated on Wild Cygnus's birth to the ISS. And uh, the purple payload actually requires 23 days of operations following departure to perform data collections and data downlink. So we still have uh, those two uh, missions to complete um, after we are on birth from the ISS. So Cygnus has a lot of work of it at Head Intel here in November. Thanks, Christina. Again, we are looking forward to welcoming Cygnus to the International Space Station, and thanks again for joining us. Of course. Thank you. And now joining us is NASA Systems Engineering Integration Office Manager Jeff Arend. Jeff, how important are these resupply missions in terms of the continuing resupply of this station and the science they deliver to the crew on board? Uh, these, uh, so I guess first off, hi, Courtney. <laughs> but these uh, commercial resupply missions are very important to continue the advancing science on board the station. Um, over 3,000 experiments have been conducted during the station's lifetime, which we're now coming up on 21 years of continuous human science. On this flight, Cygnus is packed with more than 3,700 kilos of supplies, research, technology demonstrations, and hardware. In the tech demo category, um, we're really excited to add the four-bed CO2 scrubber. It's an upgraded version of CEDRA, which is our primary CO2 removal system on board. And for hardware upgrades, we're equally excited to be flying the third IROSA mod kit, which will enable a future solar array upgrade in the future. All right, and what's ahead for the crew on station once Cygnus arrives in terms of capture cargo operations and science? So uh, the Cygnus spacecraft will arrive at Space Station in a couple days, Thursday, August 12th, at approximately 5.10 Central Time. NASA astronaut Megan MacArthur will be primed to capture the spacecraft with the Canada Arm-2, and she's backed up by ESA astronaut Thomas Pesquet. Following capture, the flight controllers in Houston will command the installation of Cygnus on the Earth-facing side of the Unity module, Will it remain for about, about three months. Uh, the crew will stay busy unpacking and conducting these research activities uh, with, uh, with the first several, de first several days being extremely critical for several experiments. Uh, the ones in particular are cardinal muscle, anti -ac The crew will also be preparing for a future spacewalk to install the mod kit on the P-4 truss to prepare the station for that future solar array upgrade that I mentioned earlier. In addition to upgrading the ISS power, these arrays are also help us prove the solar array technology that will be used on the gateway around the moon with the Artemis program. So overall, very, very exciting times for us. Exciting indeed, Jeff. As always, thanks for your time and thanks for joining us today. Yeah, appreciate it, Courtney. Thank you very much.
Recapping some milestones today, launch time today was moved to the back of the launch window after teams detected an apparent helium pressurization valve leak on the vehicle. The issue was quickly resolved and Cygnus lifted off from NASA's Wallops Flight Facility in Wallops Island, Virginia at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport Pad 0A on time at 5.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Central Time, 6.01 and 5 seconds p.m. Eastern Time to begin its journey to the International Space Station where it will deliver more than 8,200 pounds of research, crew supplies, and hardware. At the time of launch, the International Space Station was flying 260 statute miles over the southern Indian Ocean. Solar array deploy is expected to occur about one hour and 14 minutes after launch. So within the next hour, if all goes as planned, Cygnus will complete its solar array deployment, which will take about 30 minutes. We will not be on air for that milestone, but once that activity is complete, we will update the station webpage on nasa.gov. We're now on its way to the International Space Station. We hope you'll join us back on air when Cygnus arrives to the station in the early morning on Thursday, August 12th. NASA television coverage for Cygnus arrival and capture will begin at 3.45 a.m. Central Time, 4.45 a.m. Eastern Time, for capture around 5.10 a.m. Central Time, 6.10 a.m. Eastern Time. Then we'll be back on air at 7 a.m. Central, 8 a.m. Eastern for Cygnus installation operations coverage. With Cygnus now on its way to the International Space Station to deliver more than 8,200 pounds of cargo, that'll wrap up our coverage for today. This is Mission Control Houston.